Okay, well, hello everybody and welcome to another in the series of webinars that we're doing on Fusion Reactor. My name is Charlie Earhart and I'll be your host for the next hour or so. And in this edition, we're going to be doing troubleshooting JVM memory problems with Fusion Reactor. This is one that I've been looking forward to for a while because in my daily troubleshooting that I do as an independent consultant, I help people with this at least weekly, different people. And as we'll talk about, sometimes the problems are real and sometimes they're not what they seem to be. And so uh, I'm often explaining things and, and I've been looking forward to getting this on record in the form of a webinar to help people. So just a quick introduction, like I said, I'm an independent consultant. I offer consulting through my website called careheart.org and I just do server troubleshooting. It's all I do all day, every day. And I'll admit I do mostly things related to cold fusion CFML servers like Lucy, Rilo, um, and have done work with Java as well. So some people attending this webinar will be Java people and there will be value you'll get out of it. Usually the majority of people interested in Fusion Reactor these days are cold fusion people. That's a great tool for monitoring cold fusion, but it is really a Java monitor. So anyway, I'll have a little bit of a leaning towards a CF for perspective on things, but probably 90% of what I say will apply if you're just a pure Java person. So after a bit of an introduction we'll forward that we'll have, I want to go into what are some common misconceptions about memory problems and about memory itself. And then to help give a foundation for what we'll talk about the rest of the presentation, I just want to take a moment, not to go deep dive, but just take a moment to explain the key components related to memory for Java servers. And again, it's in my experience, sometimes people have a perception that isn't quite what it should be, or they forget something or they don't think of something. So anyway, we'll just level set about some key components. And then the key question, of course, is what if these JVM memory spaces fill? What do you, how do you know? What do you do about it? And that's, that's the course, uh, the, the majority of the presentation. And then to show specifically how Fusion Reactor can help prove, disprove, or diagnose such memory problems. And then specifically, you know, the classic one that most people either get or think they're getting is that their heap use is high. And again, we'll explain what the heap is earlier in the key components. But the point is if, if heap is high, and I'm saying if it is high, it really is high, heap use is high. Well, you'll understand that distinction by the time we get there. If the heap use is high, then what may be the cause? And we'll just go over some common things. And um, again, with a bit of a CF focus, uh, and, and a Java person can translate much of it to pure Java stuff as well. And then to round out the presentation, what the Fusion Reactor can't help explain a high use of heap. And that's going to happen once in a while. It doesn't look, trust me, most of the time when I help solve memory problems, we don't need to go here. But what if you can't find the explanation for why the heap use is high? What can you do about it? And I'll talk briefly about alternative tools that are available, as well as point out at the end how an upcoming release of Fusion Reactor will help even more with that particular problem. So we'll get to that when we get to it towards the end. So the little forward that I wanted to say is that this presentation is presuming that you've already been using Fusion Reactor. So this is not a how to use Fusion Reactor. If this is your first time seeing it, just let me tell you that there are several webinars that we've done in this series. I think it's now 10. And there's getting started ones and there's tips and tricks ones and there's ones about solving all kinds of different problems and using all kinds of different features. So this is uh, very specific. But perhaps you're not using it to its fullest extent and especially regarding memory issues. And again, I work with people using it every day and I sometimes find that they go, I didn't know it could do that. I didn't know it showed that. Where do I find that? I didn't know that could be tracked over time and historically and in the logs, what? So we'll, we'll explain all those things. And as I said earlier, these concepts apply generally to any Java or CFML server that Fusion Reactor can monitor. And it's worth pointing out for those maybe who are using CFML servers that Fusion Reactor does monitor any Java server. You know, there's a list of supported ones, but it's pretty much any Java server that it can monitor. And the recording, the presentation is being recorded, so you'll be able to come back and revisit these details later on. All right, so let's talk about these common misconceptions. It's just from my experience as I work with people. And the first thing is I want to say why memory problems aren't always what they seem. So um, 
there's a couple of facets of that, but just one is some, I, I, just yesterday I was talking to some people who uh, felt they had a memory problem and I helped to show that the problem might be something else. It's a natural thing to think that it's a memory problem. Maybe you even see something in your OS level monitoring that suggests it. And again, we'll get to some details about that in a bit. Uh, but I'm just saying sometimes what seems to be a memory problem isn't really a memory problem. And also sometimes what you think is a problem isn't a problem. So again, I'll show this more specifically later, but just real quickly, those of you who've looked at Fusion Reactor's, you know, graphs for memory, like if I look at the, particularly the metrics, web metrics, which is a common place people hang out. Now this is looking at, at my server, which is very, you know, low use over at the moment, not a problem, but I'm just saying if you saw this being really high, you might be freaking out thinking, oh my gosh, we're about to run out of heap. Well, I'm going to talk about later how, no, you're not necessarily going to run out of heap and how I'll show you, you can know, and that's a big difference. If you think you are and you find out, confirm, no, you're not, then you can let it go. Whereas if you think you are and you confirm that you are, then you got to deal with it. So we'll talk about that later. And then another thing I want to say is that sometimes memory problems, you know, you, you're kind of focused on that as the problem and as therefore the thing that got to, it's got to be fixed. But I'll argue sometimes that's an effect. So for instance, um, if the heap use is high, one answer is raise the size of the heap. Sure, if you've got available memory. And again, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself for those who don't know what these distinctions are. But I just want to throw out maybe the real answer is to find what's putting pressure on the heap, you know, or same with some of the other memory spaces. So we'll, this will become more clear later on. Um, and then the other thing is that what is causing high memory use, you know, there might be some configuration option, there might be some coding choice, there might be some nature to your traffic, the load. Uh, so we'll, we'll get to some of those things later. I also want to talk about this very common, common assertion. Oh, there's a memory leak. Memory use is high. What is this memory leak? Why are there so many memory leaks? Well, let me just tell you something. Most things that lead to high memory use are not memory leaks. I know everybody says that. And I'm going to explain to you that it's not a leak. It may just be that something is using that memory. And that's not a leak. If something's truly using the memory, it's not a leak. If it's, if it's using it and there's an explanation for it, you just may not know that explanation. So to you, it seems to be a leak, but when I show you later on, you'll see there are many things that can explain why memory, and especially heap, would be high and it ain't a leak. So, but if it is leak, we'll, we'll talk about dealing with that as well. And another thing I wanna say is that most memory problems really, in my experience, don't have anything to do with JVM tuning and garbage collection algorithm choices. And I know this is almost heresy because most people would think, I thought that's what I was coming here for. I thought you were going to talk to me about JVM tuning arguments and choosing garbage collection algorithms. No, I'm not. Because I'm telling you, in my experience, those are not where the answer is. Those are knobs you can fiddle with, but they're not the reason for the problem. And my point is they're not usually the answer to the problem either. I'm not saying they never would be, but I'm saying that's not where your focus should be. And here's the key point. If you have the right tools, to really diagnose the problem, you'll come to understand that that's not really where the answer is. So I know that's pushing it and maybe I've put off some who maybe are gonna say, forget it, I'm not gonna watch the rest of this. But just remember, this is a presentation on using Fusion Reactor to troubleshoot memory problems. So my goal here is to show you that you've got a weapon in hand that maybe you haven't fathomed how powerful it could be for solving what you think and maybe experience improve our memory problems. So just bear with me, I hope I didn't lose anybody there, but I want to be frank about it. And then I want to explain also that common tips and tools often fail to help, and there are a lot of myths out there, and that's kind of what I'm getting at here, is that you will find people saying, you need to do this, and you need to use that, you need to try this and go here, and again, people are well-meaning and they're trying to help, but again, I do this every day with people. Most of the time, we can solve the problems with Fusion Reactor, and the solution is often not at all what people thought it was going to be coming into the session that we had together. And again, that's bordering on, you know, condescension and patronizing and arrogance. But I'm just trying to say this comes from experience and that a lot of what people think they know ends up not being really the complete truth and it can affect 
how you go about solving problems and in terms of how you diagnose them, how you understand them, and then how you specifically solve them. So again, just bear with me. I just wanted to put those things out there. Uh, perhaps I could have let those be and, and let the presentation speak for itself, but uh, I just deal with this stuff so often that I want to put it out there. All right, so let's move on to the key components related to memory for Java servers. And there's a, several facets to this. So just let's get this uh, foundational stuff clear amongst ourselves. So when we're looking at what we think is a memory problem, we've got to determine and also consider carefully what the problem really is and where it might be because it might not be what you think it is. You can often be misled based on where you're looking or what you're looking at, okay? So let's just talk quickly. You got your box. Doesn't matter what operating system you're using, but you got a box. Virtual real doesn't matter. And in that box, you've got multiple processes running. And one of your processes is going to be your application server. It might be ColdFusion, might be Lucy, might be Rilo, might be Blue Dragon, might be Tomcat, WebSphere, WebLogic, JBoss, Jetty, Classfish, doesn't matter. The point is you've got some application server, and that's a process. And inside that process, there's a JVM. Now, let me just say the CF people may be in, not, not realize that as often because Adobe packages CF in a way that that's all hidden from you, but you're here because you know that, you know, you, you think you know that you've got memory problems and you, you know, understand it's about JVM. So I just want to be clear that there is a JVM inside of Cold Fusion, and that's what we're talking about. And so there can be issues in the JVM, but there can also be issues related to non-JVM memory in your process. And more importantly, as you can see here, I'm reflecting that you've got other processes on your box your server, whatever you want to call it, you might have a web server, yeah, and you'll probably have many, many, many other processes running on the machine. And my point is, sometimes what you perceive to be a memory problem may really be about memory on the box. Now, it's, that may be obvious to some people, but I'm just telling you that's something to be aware of. So what I want to clarify is there are operating system tools you can get that will help you watch the box and watch the processes. And even the OS tools that watch the process will tell you how much memory a process is using. But let me be clear, sometimes you will be misled if your operating system tool tells you that your web application server process is using, you know, 10 gig, or let's just say throughout, say, 6 gig, just to kind of typical thing I see with a lot of people that got relatively modest machines, and they see it's running 6 gig. And they look at their JVM arguments or the JVM setup in, in their application server, and they see that it's set to use uh, 4 gig of heap. And they're wondering, well, wait a minute, if there's only 4 gig of heap, how can the process be using 6 gig? What's wrong? Or let me put it the other way. They might see that the process is using 6 gig and their heap is set to 6 gig, and they're thinking, oh my gosh, that's got to be a problem. We're about to run out of heap. Well, I just want to clarify, no timeout. The OS tool can't tell you what's going on inside of the process. So be careful about trying to diagnose problems with OS tools. They're valuable, and, and I'm going to repeat, they're valuable especially because what you think is a problem with your op application server might really be a problem of other applications running on your server. So you got to keep those in mind. I definitely recommend you watch things at an OS level. But Fusion Reactor specifically watches the JVM, and it watches what's going on inside of the JVM. And it tells you, the, for instance, as we're going to talk about today, the various memory spaces and their use of memory. And that's important because we'll see later that there's a difference between memory that's in use and memory that's allocated. And there may be reasons that memory gets allocated over time at a higher amount than what's really needed, what's really used. And the operating system is going to be reflecting what was allocated. But inside the JVM, we might find out, well, it's not really using it. And then even more specifically, I'm going to show you that when a tool like Fusion Reactor or JVM tools say that, for instance, heap is in use to, let's say, 4 gig, well, I might be able to show you that you're not really using 4 gig at that moment anyway, either. And if you were to click a garbage collection button, it might drop down to 1 gig, in which case it's really only using 1 gig. Now, we'll make that point clearer later on. But my point is the operating system tools can mislead you, and even Fusion Reactor, if you're not aware of some distinctions, could lead you to think you've got a problem when you really don't. So, again, I just wanted to get that out of the way. Another cool thing about Fusion Reactor is that it tracks this stuff historically. So not only over time, you know, during the life of your application server, but also specifically over 
days, weeks, and months. Now you might say, wait, fusion reactor, I've noticed it can go back a week. What are you talking about? I'm saying that the logs go back as far as 30 days by default. And fusion reactor tracks in its logs much great information, including all the information about all the memory spaces. So you could look at things over time, you could look at how things ha happened before a crash, and I'll just throw out there that we've had specific webinars on post-crash troubleshooting with fusion reactor and how to make the most of the fusion reactor logs. So if you're interested in that idea, go there. I'm not gonna get into that stuff in this presentation because. I can't get into everything here. But my point I really want to make here is that these operating system tools, and I'm talking about Task Manager in Windows and Top in Linux and other variants of those, they tend not to track things historically. I mean, some don't do it at all, the basic ones. And then some of the free alternatives, they may track it over you know, hour, minutes or hours, but they tend not to track it over many hours, many days, many weeks, many months. And sometimes there's going to be value in you having such a tool. Again, that's beyond the scope of this talk to get into, but I just wanted to clarify it. Alrighty. So let's talk about the memory within the JVM. And again, not in geek level depth, but just a bird's eye view. So first let's talk about the heap, what it is and how it's used. So, well, let me back up. So the heap is a part of the memory in the JVM where objects get created to be used during your application. So whether you're creating a variable or uh, any type of variable, arrays, structures, um, if you're in CFML and you're building queries, you're creating CFC instances, you know, pretty much everything you do creates some object about some thing and that's stored in the heap. And the next point I was going to make is how long do things remain in the heap? And why might they stay there even when they're no longer in use? And this is an important point to understand. Let's say you run a program that creates you know, some variables or does some queries that brings back large result sets. Then during that moment that you're using those variables and creating those objects and queries, you might be using you know, a fair bit of memory, potentially, depending on what that thing's doing. But when that request ends, here's the key point, when that request ends, it doesn't reclaim all the memory that was used. Some of us from other languages or other IT backgrounds, we're used to application environments where, yeah, memory gets allocated and then memory gets deallocated or it gets, you know, used and it gets released. The JVM doesn't work that way. And again, I'm talking first and foremost to CF folks. When you run your CF code, under the covers it gets turned into Java. And my point is, under the covers, when that your request ends, the objects that your page requested, they don't get cleaned up. You don't do it, you know you don't do it. And I'm telling you, ColdFusion doesn't do it, and the JVM doesn't do it. Now you might say, wait, that, that gotta be terrible, that's gotta eventually be run out of memory. No, the JVM is constantly watching to see if objects are no longer in use, and when it decides that it's ready to look at that and it determines that some are no longer in use, then it gets rid of them. That's what garbage collection is. So here's the key point, we'll get to that more in a moment, but the key point is when you run a request, that say uses memory, when your request is over, the heap could still have objects related to your request. That's not a leak. That's just the JVM being lazy and it'll get to garbage collection when it gets to it. And it will get to it. And when it gets to it, it if it's that, it's gonna get rid of it. Those are objects that are no longer in use and it'll get rid of them. So we'll, we'll get to some more distinctions later, but I just wanted to make that point. So what is garbage collection? It's this process of the JVM looking at objects and deciding, should I get rid of them or not? Are they no longer in use or not? And there is an important distinction between, you know, generically termed minor and major GCs. And I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but the point is, is that we're going to see in a moment that there's different parts of memory and there's parts of memory that watch recently used objects and there's parts of memory that track long lived and still used objects, or at least at the time it's looking. So minor GCs just look at re recently used objects and, and particular memory spaces and say, can I get rid of unused objects in these recently used memory spaces? And a major GC looks more deeply and at other spaces within the JVM in the heap specifically. And so that takes longer. And the JVM does minor GCs all the time. And Fusion Reactor can actually show you this. I'll show you later. And it does major GCs occasionally. And if it ever starts to do them a lot, that's usually a sign of bad things coming. Now, there is a button in Fusion Reactor's interface. Let me show you this. 
right here on this metrics web metrics page, there's the button here called garbage collection. Now, if you look and see here, this actually is reflected right here. Move this, there you go. This, this right here <laughs> in the middle of this graph, you can see that heap use was up to about 540 and then dropped down to 417. And I know these numbers are, you know, relative to your server, you have five gig and four gig, it doesn't matter. But anyway, this is 500 and 400 and it dropped on its own. And watch, in a moment, it's gonna drop on its own again. If I just wait, you know, probably 10, 20 more seconds, we're gonna see that over here on the right, this is what's happening now, it's being updated every five seconds. And there it did, on its own, I didn't touch it, it just went down on its own, again, probably from about 500 to about 400, or okay? Yeah, five, uh, 505 down to 415, but look, I'm going to click this garbage collection button, and I didn't plan this. I didn't do anything to anticipate this. I'm just telling you that in my experience, when I do this, you'll typically see it go down even further than it went down on its own. And there you see it went down to 423. Now, again, that's not a huge amount further down, but I've seen plenty of times when we did that, it did drop even further. And so the JVM on its own is doing minor GCs and occasionally it'll do major GCs. And if you are looking at this memory graph and going, oh, I don't know, it looks awfully high, I'm worried that it might be really using memory, then that's why that button's there for you to say, hey, are you really using that memory? Is it really in use? And if it, you know, in your case, if you were at five gig max heap and it drops to only four gig, then you got a problem to worry about. For some reason, four gig is really in use, and we'll get back to that later. But if it does drop from four gig down to one gig out of five, then you're back to you know 20% and don't worry about it. So what I'm saying is that this button is there just for you as a human to go, hey, is that use of memory really truly in use? And my point I, you might have seen on the slide is I want to clarify is you do not, listen, you do not need to babysit the JVM. The JVM doesn't need your help. No, you don't need to be watching this. No, you don't need to click this button. And no, if you forget to fail to click, if you forget to click that button or fail to click it, it's not like lost, you know, that's gonna happen. You don't have to push that button. It will go down on its own when it's ready. And we'll see later that, you know, we can even see in Fusion after the garbage collection's happening. And I'll say that if it either doesn't go down on its own when memory's high and you do a GC and it doesn't go down, then we'll deal with that. That's a problem and that should be dealt with later. Okay, let's move on. So the heap is divided into generations. You hear this term, if you look into this stuff at all, you hear about different generations. And the generations, you know, names depend on the garbage collection algorithm, but just traditionally, let's just regard, traditionally there's this notion of, uh, what might be called an Eden space and a survivor space and an old gen. And just again, just generic, let's not get into depth. The Eden space is where recently created and recently used objects live. And the survivor, I mean, let's not say recently used, really it's about recently created. Recently created objects are in the Eden space and if they lived long enough, and we're talking about very short amounts of time, but if the JVM decides an object's lived long enough, it might move it to the survivor space. And then after it's determined that it's lived a longer time, it'll move it to the old generation. Again, these are very rough. Don't you know? quote me, don't pick it apart. Just let that kind of be a general idea. So the point is, is that there's these different spaces where different length life things live. There's also different parts of the JVM that aren't the heap, right? So I've been talking about the heap so far. There's also, and remember, this is just a memory within the JVM high level. So we're not going any deeper than what we've done for now. But then there's these non-heap JVM spaces. And some of you may have heard about the meta space or the perm gen. So the perm gen was in Java 7 and earlier, and the meta space is in Java 8 and above. And it's purpose is to track metadata about class loading. I don't want to go any further than that. I just want to say that's not in the heap. Now, let me just throw out there that there's been debates over the years in Java 7 and earlier about whether the perm gen was in the heap or not. And I believe it's not, but different people argue different things. But the meta space definitely is not. In Java 8 and above, that's specifically a difference is that the, the meta space actually allocates outside of JVM, you know, entirely it's out of uh, address space on, on the OS. So it's very different. But anyway, I don't get any further depth than that. 
Um, we'll come back to it perhaps a bit later. There's also something called a code cache. And in fact, let me just show you that and I'm not just pulling these things out of the air. If you come over here to Fusion Reactor and look at resources, memory spaces, resources, memory spaces. Now, many of you maybe have looked at this and gone, oh, okay, it's, it's like kind of a heap, I guess. Well, if you look up closely, it says the Eden space. And these are the, you know, used, allocated, and max colors for the Eden space. Well, up in the top right, look at these other choices. So there's the Eden, there's the survivor, there's the old, and then there's the meta space. And then I was about to talk about the code cache and the compressed class space. So those are different parts of the JVM. They are in the JVM, but they're not part of the heap. And they have different settings that control them. And they can fill, even though your heap doesn't fill. So my point here is beware. If you just look at the heap, you might be missing a problem. And sometimes when your application server crashes, it's not because the heap filled, but it's because one of these other spaces filled. And we'll talk about that later. Remember, that was one of the points we'll get to is, you know, what, how do you know and what do you do when these memory spaces fill? And then finally, I want to throw out something that just for kind of completion sake, completeness sake, there's also something called the thread space. It's not a specific allocated memory area with a JVM argument that says how big it can be. Instead, threads are allocated in the basically the leftover space within your process. And that leftover space was important back in 32-bit because your process could only be 2 gig. On Windows and Linux, you could only have a 2 gig process. And after you had your heap and your other non-heap areas, the amount of space space left and, and some OS stuff on top of it, the amount of space left could have been kind of compressed and squeezed and there wouldn't be left much space and you could get an error from running out of the ability to allocate new native threads. If you remember that error in the past, out of memory, new native thread, that was the inability to allocate threads in that leftover space. So there isn't a setting to control that, but it's just left over. Again, it's not as important in 64-bit world because we don't generally have much of a limitation on our address space size and 64 bit. Okay, so now what if these other JVM memory spaces fill or these JVM memory spaces, I should have said. So first limits are set via JVM arguments for their maxes and their mins. And the defaults for these things vary depending on the JVM version, depending on uh, perhaps resources on your box because there are some heuristics that the JVM uses and also depending on your OS and the versions of your OS and the versions of the JVM. So I'm not gonna give you any defaults, but I'm just gonna say there are defaults or you can set them. So you've probably, seen there's an XMX and an XMS and these set the heap size max and min. Now there's an XMN and you might think that means min but no it's and it's not XMM it's XMS but anyway that's the min and the max heap size and just throw out a little thing you don't really need to set one. If you didn't set one the JVM would default I believe it's a quarter of the available memory but you know you can read that because again it depends on your JVM version, depends on your OS, and so most people don't leave it to the uh, JVM to figure it out. They set a size, but I just want to throw out you don't technically need to set a size. The metaspace there's a max metaspace size and a metaspace size, and that you know is the max and the min, and this is as of Java 8. And you notice the one has XX in front of it because that's the way the nomenclature works in the JVM arguments. This particular one you put an XX in front of. Same with the perm gen. You said XX max perm gen and perm gen. That was the max and the min in Java 7 and earlier. And then that thing I talked about, the reserve, uh, sorry, the code cache. You've probably never even seen this one before, but I'm just telling you. There is a memory space called the code cache, and there is a way to set its size. And if you don't set it, you get the default, which you should look into the docs for whatever OS and JVM version you're using and figure out what the default is. Or, hey, cool thing about Fusion Reactor, let me look at the code cache, why it must be about 256. Now you might say, well, no, Charlie, it says 240. Now I get that, but you've probably noticed that the way numbers work, especially big numbers, these are 256 million bytes, so that's 256 meg. The way those numbers work, you don't really get exactly 256. You get somewhere around that, and it's, it's. I won't go into the details, but the point is, Fusion Reactor is telling you what the max is. It's 240 which I'm telling you translates to about 256. I'm sure if you look it up, you'll find that in my particular OS and JVM version, the 
code cache, reserve code cache size is 256. My point is if you were in here looking at this graph and you saw that it was up near the top, then you want to consider raising that reserve code cache. So again, we're not even getting into the real diagnostic and troubleshooting, but I'm just throwing out that there's a benefit right there of any JVM tool that shows you your memory spaces if it shows you not just the used and the allocated, but also shows you the max, you can determine from here what is that max. And same with this next one, which is called the compressed class space. And so it looks like in this particular case, it's probably 1024, and for some reason, it's at exactly 1024. I'm not gonna debate or question that. Now, one last thing is I wanna throw out for those of you that use um, Java 8 and you set uh, you, you choose not to set a max metaspace size. Some of you may know that if you don't set a max metaspace size, then in Java 8, you can use as much memory as is available in the OS. Well, in that regard, if you come in here and look at the metaspace, I think you, right, you won't see a max, right? You just see what you're using and allocating because Fusion Reactor and the JVM don't know a max. There's no max to show because you didn't set one. Okay. So again, not a big deal, but I just wanted to get that out of there. All right, and there's the setting for setting the compressed class space size. So now I mentioned the uh, threads space, and I made the comment that there is no setting that says what's the maximum thread space. That's set by the OS. It's what's available within the process. But there is an XSS and that's for stack size. And that's the size of each thread, the maximum size of each thread. Again, we don't need to go any further depth than that. I'm just saying that XSS does not set the size of the stack space, it says the size of each stack, and then the JVM allocates, sorry, the size of each thread, and it is a stack that's being tracked. But anyway, the point is it sets the size of the thread stack size, and it can allocate as many of those as is room available in the OS within your process, which again in 64-bit is not usually an issue. Now my point here is that errors can happen with any of these. You can get out of memory errors for any of these in the heap, the metaspace perm gen, the code cache, any of them, the thread space, all of them, you can get errors. And some might just pass by, you might even see an error in the log somewhere, and some will crash the JVM. So some are important and some are really not that important. Believe it or not, you could quote, run out of heap and your JVM won't crash because it was just momentary, temporary, and it got past it. Maybe some particular thing failed, but it was able to keep going. And now in other cases, you might truly run out of heap. There's literally no space left and nothing can run anymore. And eventually you might find the JVM just hangs or maybe eventually it crashes. So I'm just saying there are differences in what can happen when these things fill. And I just want to point out that you can find evidence of these things happening typically in your J uh, application server's logs in your, uh, like in the case of Cold Fusion, and then we're talking about the Cold Fusion outlog. Uh, and in the case of Lucy, we're talking about the uh, Catalina log for Tomcat. And then your other JVM app or JVM Java servers each have their own logs. So whatever is the console logs, the standard app logs, whatever. So that's where you could look for some errors to have happened. Also, ColdFusion has a ColdFusion error log, and, and in older versions, they showed up in ColdFusion error logs as well. But anyway, look at this JVM logs. You might think, what am I talking about here? Well, in the case of, let's just say ColdFusion, certain crashes kill the JVM, and there's going to be a log in the directory where the JVM config lives. So we're talking about the ColdFusion bin directory, the CFusion bin and ColdFusion 10 and above, or your instance bin. So, or in the older versions it was, you know, runtime bin, but where the JVM config lived, yeah, you could sometimes find, hey, look, there's logs in here, and they're logs that indicate that the JVM crashed. And especially some of the more esoteric uh, memory spaces filling, you might see logs of those in there. And so check that out. Anyway, I gotta move on. So how can Fusion Reactor prove, disprove, or diagnose? So we've talked about how you can quickly and easily see the heap use. You saw the use allocated to max. I just wanna just take a moment and, and point out that you know at the highest level you sit here at the metrics web metrics, and in the top right corner you can see the heap, just the heap, and you see in dark orange the used, and in light orange the allocated, and then lighter orange the max. All right, 
So that's that. And if you didn't know, you can come to below the CPU graph and change this to look at things over an hour. So all six graphs changed to look at things over the last hour. And then you can click on any of these links underneath any of the graphs and it changes to showing you that particular thing is the only thing that's graphed. And so there we go. There's the heap graphed. And you can look now not only at an hour, but also at a day or at a week. And, you know, yours may look very different. Lots of people see it going up and down all the time. And there's like a sawtooth pattern. That's perfectly normal. That's generally minor GCs happening. And the farthest it dropped to is a reflection of what's really in use. Or you could do a GC and see how far it falls. But anyway, there's also a week view. And you might see a slightly different pattern over the course of a week. All right. And then I also showed you that over here under resources, there was memory spaces. And this too has our day and week. And let me also clarify for those who knew this stuff. It's only going to go back as far as your application server has been up. So if you just restarted it three hours ago, then the day view is only going to go back three hours. If you started it yesterday, the week view is only going to go back to yesterday. So it's tracked in the JVM and it only goes back as long as the JVM has been up and running. And remember too that you can change the different memory spaces. Okay. Now there was more over here. I just kind of blew by here. Let me scroll down. Sorry, I'm a keyboard guy and the keyboards are not responding so well. So over here you can see not just the memory spaces, but you can also see that graph of the heap, which is what you know we saw earlier when I clicked the, in fact, it's this graph, when I clicked the link under the heap graph of the metrics. But then look, there's also a heap non-heap, which is kind of an interesting thing. It's not something I generally get a lot of value out of myself, but so it's showing the heap use in, I always get this confused, uh, memory non-heap used in orange. Okay, so this is the non-heap and this is the heap. So the blue is the heap like we just saw on the other screen. And then in the brown here is the sum of all those non-heap spaces, the sum of the non-heap spaces. So there might be value in looking at that sum of the non-heap spaces and especially maybe to see if there's some wild changes being happening. And then you could go dig into each of the memory spaces. Okay. And we covered that, and we covered that. Now garbage collection, I said you can see that. That's also under resources. Look, resources, garbage collection. All right, and it too tracks things over time. But let's come back to the screen for a second. So first it shows duration and then activity and then the amount of memory freed. Because remember garbage collection is to free memory. Then, within each graph, it's tracking what, in the case of my particular GC algorithm, uh, if it's the parallel GC, it's using this term scavenge for minor GCs and this term mark sweep for major GCs. And you can see that minor GCs in green, they're happening pretty frequently, like every uh, it's like 20 seconds or so. And it's just not exactly every 20 seconds. The JVM decides when to do it. And there's arguments, or arguments to tell it to do it more frequently, but I'm telling you, that's not usually the answer. You don't need to tell the JVM what to do. It knows what to do. But anyway, it'll do it when it wants to do it. Look, it just did too. So, you know, it, it decided that there was something to do and it decided there was an available uh, f free resource time where it wasn't busy doing other stuff. And that's the bottom line is that sometimes the JVM gets uh, you know, busy doing other stuff and then you go, I'll take care of garbage collection later. It's kind of like the kid who, you know, you tell him to take out the trash and he doesn't take it out until he hears the truck coming up the street. Oh, I got to take out the trash. That can happen sometimes. I call that about laziness of the garbage collection algorithm. It might wait. Literally, let me tell you, it could wait till your heap was 95% full. I could show you in the Java 1.5 documentation that that's when things change, these um, um, heuristics of the, uh, they call it ergonomics, the ergonomics of the JVM, where it might choose to wait till it was 95% full. So just don't freak out because you don't see it garbage collecting. If you want to check it out, do it yourself. But the point is, if you do it or if the JVM does it, that manual GC or if you let it do a major GC, that'll be tracked here. And they're not happening often. And then this tracks, sorry, how long they take, and this tracks how often they're happening per second. 
and usually there's just one per second, but sometimes there might be more. So the bigger point is how long are they taking, and they're just taking hundreds of milliseconds, and then perhaps for some people the biggest point is how much memory are they freeing, and usually, you know, it depends on what your application is doing. You might, let me tell you, you might see it freeing two gigs every time. It doesn't matter. There's, I don't think there's anything you need to worry about if you see it freeing two gigs. It just means your server is very busy, you're creating a lot of objects, and they're being released when the JVM decides to do garbage collections. Sometimes people over focus and stress about things that not really needing to stress about. But anyway, it too has a garbage collection button and you can look at things over these long periods of time. And we talked about GCs. And I want to make the point again that all this stuff we just looked at, all these memory spaces, they're all logged over time and kept for 30 days by default. So there's a log for the old gen, there's a log for the survivor space, there's a log for the meta space, there's a log for the compressed code cache. So my point is you could look at those after a crash and maybe see, oh yes, there was a problem in one of them, or you could look at them and see that, oh, they're trending upward over time, maybe in the last minute before the crash or the last hour before the crash or over days over the crash, whatever. And again, the last webinar was about making the most of logs and pulling them into tools to be able to analyze them and other tools from integral that makes Fusion Reactor that can help analyze those logs over time. And so I think I've said this already, ways that Fusion Reactor can be misinterpreted to suggest a memory problem. I'm just saying you could look at that memory graph and go, oh my gosh, we're running out of memory. And unless you do the GC button to confirm that it cannot be GC'd, you could be misled into thinking you've got a memory problem when you don't. So if heap use is high, now you can appreciate what I'm talking about. If we do a GC and it doesn't drop much, and therefore you're worried that, uh oh, we're running out of heap, what can what, what could be the cause? And the key point is that it's usually about objects that are living longer than you expected. And that's not a leak, right? I'm just telling you, be careful about throwing the term leak around. Because just because an object lives longer than you expect, it doesn't mean that it's a leak. In the case of CFML, and to some degree in other Java application servers, the common causes are things like, for instance, sessions. Now, when I say sessions, some people's brains go to Google Analytics and stuff like that. We're not talking about those kind of sessions. We're talking about in your application server, a session is a set of data tracked for a user over a period of time and over multiple requests. And there's a session timeout set in your application or in the app uh, administrator and that those session variables will live until they time out, okay? And the point is they live beyond life of request. So if somebody runs a request just once and you put a big query in the session scope, well, that memory for that session variable is gonna last as long as that session. And I've seen people that have sessions last for 20 minutes, two hours, two days. I've seen it all. And there's settings that can control the max and the admin and things like that, but just, my point is it could definitely be easily an hour and you may have a high number of sessions and you might have a surprisingly large number of sessions. And if you have lots of sessions lasting a long time, holding lots of data, then you're going to have high heap use because of that. And that's not a leak. And maybe you might want to look at your configuration or look at your coding or look at your like what you put in the session variables or consider the impact of traffic and that's another whole subject is that you might be having sessions being created by spiders and bots and monitoring tools and load balancer pings and hackers and this isn't the talk to get into that but the point is you could end up with tens of thousands hundreds of thousands of sessions in your application server and i just want to point out that fusion reactor can tell you that too so it's not about memory in later versions, I think it's Fusion Actor 6 and above, it's under user sessions, user sessions. Now, if you're still on Fusion Actor 5, it's under metrics custom series. But in Fusion Actor 6, it's under user sessions. And this tracks at the current moment how many sessions have been created and destroyed and rejected, and we'll get into that detail, but more importantly, how many are there active? So on my server, there's right now a thousand sessions. And I might have thought, well, I didn't think my server was that busy. I don't think there's that many people logging. It's not. It's because of spiders and bots and hackers and other kind of things trying to visit my site all the time. And especially if you can go out to the hour, or day, or week view, you might see, especially on your server, you might see wild fluctuations. You might see that each day it goes up and then at night it goes down 
or heck, it might stay okay during the day and at night it might go up and then go down. It all depends on what's going on in your environment. But my point is some people are shocked to look at the session count and go, oh, we've got 100,000 sessions or we've got 40,000 sessions and you thought you might only have a few hundred. Well, that's going to impact keep. Same with other shared variable scopes. So again, this is focused on CF and CFML people. So if you have application scope, server scope usage, those things, when you put stuff in them, whether it's a simple variable or a array or a struct or a CFC or a query, whatever, they're going to stay in there until you restart your application. Think about it. If, if, if you, and I've seen people who had in their application scope an array that tracked information about every user that got onto the server. So for every session that was created, they were creating an application variable to track some information about each quote user. And they didn't realize that sessions were being created in the tens or hundreds of thousands. And now the application scope was also blowing up because of that. Or you could put all kinds of stuff in application scope or the server scope. The point is they do live until generally a restart because like the server scope has no timeout and the application scope, while it has a timeout, I think it's two days by default. You got to think about it. It's when your application is not in use for two straight days. That's just never going to happen. So basically they never time out. And so you got to be careful about what you put in there. And unfortunately, there's no particular feature in Fusion Reactor to show that. Now, some of you might say, wait, wait, Charlie, I thought I've seen that. Well, you may have. If you look up here at metrics, CF system metrics, or it might be CF metrics. I, yeah, it's the other one, CF metrics. I don't go to it as much because I'll explain why it's not as useful for most people. So metrics, CF metrics. No, where is it? That is CF metrics, yeah. Ah, there it was. I'm sorry, I missed it. Because I don't pay much attention to it. Look right here. So this graph under CF system metrics shows session scope size, application scope size, server scope size. And then in green, template cache size. And you might notice, hmm, all I see is template cache size. What's up with that? Well, what's up with that is, again, we're talking to ColdFusion people, CFML people. I'm not sure about Lucy. I haven't paid attention to this particular detail with Lucy. But the template cache is something in CF that is always on. You can't turn it off. You can control its size. And this lets you see how many templates are in the template cache. In terms of their uh, count down here and in terms of the memory used up here. So this 4K. It's nothing. No big deal. But, but notice there's nothing else. You might wonder, well, what's going on? Well, if you look up here, it says ColdFusion memory monitoring is disabled. Some metrics may not be available. Enable it in ColdFusion Enterprise. So this is a subtle point here. If you have ColdFusion Enterprise, then in ColdFusion Enterprise, there's a server monitor. And in the server monitor, there's a feature called memory tracking. And if you turn on memory tracking, then ColdFusion will track the memory use in each scope. And then Fusion Reactor would have access to that information. Now, some of you are quaking in your boots at the thought of turning on the server monitor's memory tracking, and you'd be right. The memory tracking feature in the server monitor can sometimes be a killer. It actually can bring down your application server. So most people don't have it turned on, and therefore most of you will not be able to use Fusion Reactor to look at the server scope size and the app scope size. You just have to take my word for it to consider those as likely places where there could be high use of memory, which is still, quote, in use and therefore can't be GC'd and therefore is not a leak. Then there's query caching. You may know that you can cache queries in CFML and there's an admin setting for how many you can cache and there's an application level setting that you can override and, and you control in your code when you do caching of queries. Now Fusion Reactor does have a feature to watch that. We were just talking about it. It's on this page. So under metrics, CF system metrics, look, there's the cached query count. And I've currently got five, six hundred things cached in my query cache. Now it doesn't tell me the size because it's not got memory tracking turned on. That light green isn't here. But I can see the number and that's interesting. And you might you know be surprised to find you've got more than you thought. And the size is dependent on the size of the query you do. You could do one query that brings back one record. You can do one query that brings back a million records. They'd be very different sizes, even though they're both only one entry in the query cache. So anyway, there's template caching. I talked about that, and that's tracked. And that actually, all these things are stored in the heap. The templates that are cached are stored in the heap. When, when we say template caching, we're talking about the compiled CFML 
that gets loaded as a Java click. It gets compiled as a Java class and it gets loaded uh, and it gets loaded into the heap. So the template cache is in the heap and it contributes to heap use. Also, if you use the, the EH cache features of ColdFusion 9 and above, you could cache pages, you can cache portions of pages, you can cache objects, and actually under the covers, the query cache is stored in EH cache. But my point is if you do your own EH cache caching, that goes into the heap. And unfortunately, Fusion Reactor doesn't have any insight into that currently. And then if you do RM, there's ability to cache things in ORM. And again, Fusion Reactor doesn't have anything to track that. And then there's a virtual file system, VFS, since CF9. And that all that stuff is stored in the heap. And then let me tell you one more thing for those that are in CF. From CF9 and earlier, these things tended to be cached in a space that was shared across all apps. So the query cache was 100, by default it was 100 max cached queries and one app could blow out the other, the cache and kill other apps being able to use it because they all were in the same sandbox, their own same pool. They were distinguished from each other but they were all in one big pool. Well in CF10 and above, in this change to using EH cache under the covers, now each application gets its own cache. So each application has its own query cache, its own EH cache, and so on and so on. So that's a nice feature. But it does mean that the same application running on 9 and earlier could use more heap in 10 and above simply because you have lots of applications doing lots of query caching, doing lots of EH caching. And they were kind of constrained before to a limit across all apps. Now they're the limit is per app. So hopefully that makes sense to people. And then finally that enterprise server monitor memory tracking. Let me tell you something. I've helped many people who were having what seemed to be memory problems. And once we kind of ruled all these things out, we thought, well, gosh, what else could it be? And we looked at the server monitor and oh, look at that. Memory tracking was turned on and we turned it off and boom, memory problems went away. And you might be thinking, well, wait, you're telling me if I turn on this memory tracking feature that's supposed to help me solve memory problems, it causes them? Yes it can cause memory problems. And some of you already know that it can bring down your application server. So again, don't enable that memory tracking. Most people would be harmed more by it. Uh, so just beware. It's a tool, but it's a gun that can kill you if you're not careful. And then finally, there can be leaks. Yes, there can be leaks typically caused by bugs, bugs in the database drivers, bugs in some implementation of Cold Fusion. There could even be a bug in Fusion Reactor. It could happen, it's happened. Integral, the company that makes it, would never want that to last long. So if you ever find that Fusion Reactor seems to be a cause of a memory leak, let the engineers know. Email support at fusion-reactor.com. It's at the end of this presentation. They will want to fix that because they never want Fusion Reactor to be an impact at all. So what about true leaks? Well, you might have true leaks. If Fusion Reactor can't explain the high heap, you might have a true leak, and those can be hard to identify with Fusion Reactor alone. And that really is where the next step is to do what's called heap analysis. And some of you might have thought that would be what I would do from the beginning. Well, I would argue, no, if you consider everything I've told you, this is the last resort, especially for people in CFML. Because it's especially hard to connect the dots of what you see in the JVM's heap analysis and the underlying Java objects, it's hard to connect that back to the CFML that created that object. It's not impossible, but it's pretty hard. So I'm just saying that I would, for most people, leave this as the last resort. Now, Java people might go, not the first tool I go to. Okay, it makes sense for Java people to maybe jump right into it. But for CF folks, I'm just saying this is not the first thing to do. And the cool news is that there are many tools, free and commercial, that can do such heap analysis. Visual VM is included with the JDK recent versions. It's very good, it's adequate, it's really very good. Others are Eclipse's MAT and memory analysis tool. And there's commercial Your Kid and JProfiler tools that add even more powerful capabilities. So again, we don't have time to get into all these, but the bottom line is you take what's called a heap dump, literally taking a snapshot of the heap, and it could be gigs in size, but usually it happens pretty quickly. And so you take a heap dump, and that tracks the details of every object in memory in the heap and the connections among them and, and how they're connected to each other and one that might be referring to another, which could often be very important. And you can do that heap dump manually with the tools, or you can set a JVM argument that says, hey, if I get an out of memory in the heap before you go down, take a heap dump that can be configured and some of you might find that is configured and every time your instance goes down it takes a little bit of time and it's because it's configured to take that heap dump on and out of memory. You might want to say well if I'm not doing that memory analysis I'm going to turn off that feature to create that heap dump. I don't need it. I'm not looking at it. But if you do do it and you want to look at it those tools 
are what you want to use. And the step, next step would be to analyze the heap. And these tools let you look at such characteristics as what are the largest classes by size individually? What are they largest by count in total or by size and count together? in aggregate and as percentages of others. So lots of cool things. You can filter the classes by name and for instance, look for just cold fusion class names if you wanted to, for instance. And there's a concept of GC roots for finding out something in more detail that I don't wanna get into right now. But the point is you can Google it and find out more if you want to. But the point is, these are things you can do with such heap analysis tools. And it just is beyond the scope of this webinar to get into that. So finally, I want to point out that there is good news for those using Fusion Reactor and that it will help with that very kind of analysis in the future. The next release, Fusion Reactor 7, which is due sometime this year, is going to include heap profiling. Yeah, that stuff I just talked about. It's going to be built into Fusion Reactor. You won't need to install any JDK tools. You won't need to configure RMI and open ports to be able to get to it. You won't have to worry about whether you're starting your service, uh, running your application server as a service or what user you're running it as. None of that will matter. It's going to be an interface within the UI. If you've got Fusion Reactor Ultimate, as I happen to, you might notice there's a debugger. And the debugger was introduced to Fusion Reactor 6 Ultimate is a line debugger, interactive step debugger. And the point is it's built into Fusion Reactor. It's a web interface and we've had webinars and I've done videos on using that. There's a profiler tool. This is about thread profiling and tracking where was time spent within the JVM methods of a given request. And those tools can all be very valuable. But the point is, there's other tools that do these things, but Fusion Reactor does them inside the web interface. You don't have to install any tool. You don't have to enable any JVM arguments. It's just all handled for you. And there's a web interface for looking at it. And that's the way it's going to be with this memory analyzer. Okay. And you'll be able to view and analyze the heap dumps similar to those other tools. You'll be able to look at the counts and the sizes and filter on class names and find GC roots. All that will be possible in this. So that'll be cool. But like I said, some of you might be really excited about that. I just want to temper your enthusiasm because there can be value to it. But I would argue that's not where you should go first because you're often going to have a hard time connecting the dots. But I'm not saying don't do it. It's a valuable tool. And remember, Fusion Reactor is a Java monitoring tool. And Java people might have been more readily able to connect the dots of what a heap analysis would show. And so Fusion Reactor, including that, is going to be great for them. It's going to be very good for people that use CFML. You will learn, and there'll be more discussion of this over time. We'll do a webinar on it in the future that will show more about doing this. Again, I didn't want in this webinar to go into that kind of stuff with those tools, but when we do a webinar on the new heap analysis tool, we'll talk more about how you might be able to connect the dots and how to use the capabilities to perhaps connect the dots back to your CFML. And like the debugger and the thread profiling tool, this memory profiling will be an ultimate, Fusion Reactor ultimate edition feature. And I just want to point out that so many great features now justify considering that, the memory profiler, the request profiler, the step debugger. So if you haven't considered the ultimate edition, there's many, many more capabilities that you should consider about it that make it worth considering. Sorry, there's not more, there are more things, but I'm saying these things are many things that should lead you to consider that ultimate edition if you want those capabilities. Now, finally, what about JVM tuning? And I've mentioned this before, you may have noticed I have not talked about JVM tuning. We haven't talked about arguments to control the ratios among the heap generations. We haven't disabled explicit GCs. We haven't chosen or talked about choosing different garbage collection algorithms. That's because in my experience doing this stuff for 10 years, they're not the solution. And I know that there's some people that say that's the first thing you should be doing. I just disagree because in my experience, those are not ever the answer. My observation is that the popularity of these things arise because people are in a panic and they start Googling and they find anything they can find. And often the resources that are found are from people who maybe haven't used good tools to diagnose their issues. I'm not saying this is true of everybody. 
that it recommends those things, but I'm saying I see many people who just trying to help others say, hey, I've you know heard that if you've got a memory problem, you should get these heap analysis tools, or I've heard that you should try these JVM arguments, and they get passed around like baseball cards. And I would argue that's not the right answer because you don't know that those JVM args are right for your server. They may have been right for somebody else, but how do you know they're right for you? And they just recommend these different JVM tweaks, which I think is like throwing darts at a balloon and open you'll pop it with the right tools. My point is with the right tools, you'll be able to really solve the problem. So I'm not saying you never need to tweak your args or change your algorithms. I'm just saying that's not the first thing that I would do. And these other things that I've talked about have gotten most people the answers to their problems. Okay. All right. So in conclusion, right here at the top of the hour, Again, remember I said memory problems are just not often what they seem. And what you think is a memory leak may just be long-lived objects. And memory problems really are generally an effect. You need to find the cause. And the cause may be something that you're doing or that you're not realizing is happening. And chasing JVM arguments and even memory sizes is usually not the answer. The, the real answer is find the root cause of the problem and fix it. Okay. And find the memory space that is in trouble. That's why I started with that depiction of, you know, is it really in your JVM or is it really on the box or are you misled by the OS tool telling you the memory quote memory use and your application server is high, but then you look in the fusion reactor and you go, oh, well, it's allocated a high amount, but it's not using a high amount. Or you say, oh, it's using a high amount, but when I do a GC, it drops. So it wasn't really using it. So I'm just saying, you really got to dig into these things. And then if it is really using it, find out what's causing that memory space to fill. And we've seen that Fusion Reactor has several tools in its interface and its logs to help with that, whether it's heap use or the other spaces within the heap or the non-heap -mem memory spaces. And we've learned it can show you garbage collection and so much more. And that next release will have heap profiling, which will be a vital tool for some people. All righty. So just real quickly, we do plan to do more webinars in the future. And for those that were on the making the most of Fusion Reactor logs. You might have noticed I talked in the middle about using Excel and I wanted to go into more and I kind of realized I had to stop myself. And so we're going to do another one just on analyzing them with Excel because there's much more you could do. I was really tempted to show you things and I had to bite my tongue and leave it for later. So we'll do another one that'll get into it more in depth. And we've also got plans for another troubleshooting identifying <laughs> issues part two. And you can learn more about these at fusionreactor.com slash webinars or webinar. And you can find recordings of past webinars there also, and including this one will be there probably by tomorrow. And if you have questions, you can find them at, or you can get them answered on your own at the website or at the sales or support addresses or by calling the phone number for sales oriented questions. And if you have need of consulting assistance, you can reach out also to cfconsultant.com, which is the consulting site for Integral, the company that makes Fusion Reactor. And sometimes it'll be I who they reach out to to come and help you. So uh, anyway, we welcome your feedback on this webinar and other webinars and any you'd like to see. So with that, let's stop and take questions. And I'd seen there was one, I just want to go ahead and power through to kind of wrap up. Uh, and so this one question, is there also logs of what is done inside Fusion Reactor manual garbage collection? So I, you're saying if you do a manual GC, is there a log that says you did it? The answer would be no, there's not a log that says you did a manual GC in Fusion Reactor. But yes, there's a log that says a major GC was done, right? We saw that. And I, I guess you know, it's like you just wrote this about several minutes ago. So that was well after I'd shown you the graph so, and the log. So yes, the fact that you do a major CGC or that it's done, that's logged. The fact that you did it by clicking the button, no, it's not specifically tracking that. Fair question, but no. The detailed CF monitoring of cache queries, that's Adobe CF only. Any options for Rilo Lucy? Thanks. Uh, and thanks for your comment there. Um, I can't remember specifically, just check it out for yourself. I believe that there's a, I'm pretty sure there's a Lucy specific, what they call plugin. So there's a Cold Fusion plugin and I'm pretty sure there's a Lucy plugin and I'm pretty sure it gives some of that same level of detail. But I know it doesn't give this all of it because Lucy doesn't have even the provision for that memory tracking that CF does. 
but you can see why Lucy didn't do it because most people would say don't do it in cold fusion and it was added in CF8 and there's you know not been a lot of attention paid to that over the years so anyway Lucy doesn't do that and therefore you won't find that stuff in even the Lucy plugin but it might track the things that are basically free it's pretty free to track something like query caching but whether Lucy does it I can't remember um, so check that out yourself and thank you everybody for your kind uh, comments and you've said somebody said it's not there for me uh, so you're saying no you don't see the query caching so listen Ivan send an email to support at fusion com and ask them about that and they'll either tell you it's on the radar or they'll tell you they're waiting for the Lucy team to expose that because the bottom line is that if Lucy exposes it then fusion Raptor can expose it if it don't then they can't and again thanks everybody for the other uh, other kind comments and we're right here about five minutes after I'm sorry I ran just a little bit long I'll go ahead and be stopping the uh, recording because I don't see any further questions for the past minute so thanks everybody very much and until the next one thank you <laughs>